what Neuralink is and what the goal of it is? Uh, we put a, a chip in your brain to control your mind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, for, so Neuralink, you'll be able to see Neuralink coming from a very long distance because any device that you implant in a human is you have to go through a million, so many tests. Um, it, it moves very slowly. You just do a few people at a time, and then um, you, you go to extreme lengths to prove safety. Um, you have to go through the FDA approvals. Like we're not trying to sidestep any, you know, uh, regulatory approvals. We're um, doing everything, you know, by the book and uh, with maximum. We're really, actually, we're going uh, far beyond what the requirements are of the FDA from a safety standpoint. Um, and the, the initial devices will really just be a pretty basic. Um, will be about restoring functionality to people who've lost their connection between their their brain and their body. So you can imagine, like, if say Stephen Hawking could talk or communicate um, as fast as uh, somebody with a fully functioning body. Mm -hmm. That would be amazing. So that's like the what we're trying to do. That, that's our first application is to restore functionality to quadriplegics, tetraplegics, and, and people who have just for whatever reason uh, no longer have a connection between or, her, uh, or a limited connection between their, 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 their brain and their body. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second application would be restoration of eyesight. So if somebody's got, uh, gone completely blind, maybe even just lost the optic nerve, um, you can actually still uh, directly uh, stimulate the neurons in the visual part of the, the cortex. Um, so you can give, give a direct vision to the brain. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, you could actually depending upon what cameras you use, you can actually see in different wavelengths. I, I really think that um, artificial general intelligence, digital superintelligence is likely to arrive before we have really advanced neural links. At least that's where the trend is right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but, but ultimately the idea would be to achieve a symbiosis between our biological mind and our kind of digital mind. So we, we're already kind of a cyborg uh, if you think of like your phone and your computers as an extension of yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, like if you leave your phone behind, it's like you have missing limb syndrome. You're like, you know, <laughs> where did it go, you know? Um, and uh, so the phone is a kind of an extension of ourselves, like computer is, uh, various applications that we use are already an extension of self. So we, we are already a cyborg, it's just that the interface is uh, with our eyes and our fingers. Yeah. Um, and um, and that that interface, especially output, the rate at which we can type words into a phone or a computer, just it's very slow. Our, the, our input is much better because with, with the data rate from vision is, um, you know, I don't know, many thousands of times, maybe a million times better than the rate at which we can um, output. So input is like maybe I don't know, roughly a million times better than output, and. Uh, so, so what what a neural link device can do is improve that bandwidth, allow you, allow um, you to be sort of much more symbiotic with your the, the AI extension of yourself. Mm -hmm. So you can think of like like a human brain really is could, could be arguably divided into two parts. One is kind of like the primitive uh, brain, um, the, the reptile brain, it's sometimes called. You know, it's like a, a sort of basic instincts and. Um, and then we've got the cortex, like the higher level thinking, planning, and that kind of thing. Um, but the two operate symbiotically. So I haven't yet met anyone who wants to delete their limbic system or delete their cortex. Everyone's quite happy having both. Yeah. They're like, oh, I like it the way it is, you know. Um, but your cortex is way smarter than your limbic system. So, but the irony is that even though the cortex is way smarter than the limbic system, most of what it's doing is trying to make the limbic system happy. It's like limbic system's hungry. Hungry. Okay, let's get some food. Mm -hmm. um, the limbic system is horny. Okay, let's you know have sex or whatever. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, the sheer amount of 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 effort the you know the, the cortexes have of all the humans have put into trying to get laid is insane. <laughs> <laughs> it's really like too simple to understand that like sex does not result result in, in procreation because mm -hmm. for almost all of human existence that it did. Um, your birth control is a very recent thing. So the, the, the limbic system is like trying to incent procreation. 
And um, but but now we can effectively hack the limbic system by doing procreation, but by having sex without procreation. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you think of like the computers as a, as a sort of a third layer, um, the AI is a third layer. It's not necessarily the case that the um, AI would be acting contrary to our interests. I think if it's closely linked with our biological intelligence, I think it could um, actually be just simply, again, trying to make the cortex happy, which is trying to make the limbic system happy. So I think we'll put even more computing power to try to get laid, mm -hmm. basically. <laughs> um, now the AI is going to help you get laid. <laughs> I'd worry a bit more about digital super intelligence. I'd worry about let's try to avoid World War III. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's make sure we're at least having enough kids to sustain our population. But there's some chance that it will not, and I think we just need to be cognizant of that and, and understand it's a powerful technology, it's a double-edged sword, um, and we need to put a lot of effort into ensuring that uh, we have a good AI outcome and not a bad one. What, so, what does a good one look like? Well, if, I, I'd recommend people read the Ian Banks books, okay. uh, the culture books. Um, that's the best uh, representation of a positive AI human future that I've seen. Okay. Um, so, but that's my recommendation. I mean, it, it effectively AI. I think it'll, 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 it will massively enhance the human ability. It's like a just a massive amplifier of human ability. Um, just like the computer was. Um, so, r really, it's just a question of like, does, does it, uh, there's some risk that it doesn't merely amplify human activity, but it starts basically just being in charge. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's some risk it may you know, view humanity negatively and mm -hmm. decide that we're a, a blight on the earth. Like, like I think like, like a very dangerous thing would be if, if the, if they sort of, human extinctionist philosophy somehow got into AI, that would be... Um, so, no, I think the, the rate of change, the, rate, the change caused by AI is going to be pretty radical, so there, there will you know, a lot of jobs that are that currently exist, won't exist in the future, but I think there will be new jobs. Um, exactly, so it's like, how do we find meaning um, and relevance? Yeah. Um, if you have an age of abundance where the computer can just ask for anything and get it, um, it, it is something we'll have to struggle with. That, that'll, that'll be, I don't know. It's, I think that's kind of most likely where we're headed is an age of abundance. Mm. Um, but it will definitely cause some existential angst. Um, unless we do sort of effectively have better symbiosis increase the bandwidth to our the AI extension of ourselves effectively augment our human intelligence substantially um, we may not even be able to appreciate the wonders that will exist in the future <laughs>